Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila, delicious and smooth tequila, made in harmony with the earth. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. Hey, hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. This is a special remote recording. I happen to be in the All-Star Game week. I'm in Boston, right next to Fenway Park. I'm a baseball fan. I'm a beer fan, but we don't usually talk about baseball and beer on uh, on the show. But So I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host here, Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. So we're out here at uh, Plant Pub, a, a new pub with a plant-based vegan menu uh, by a craft beer and trompreneur in the Fenway region of, of Boston. So you got me out here on the road uh, checking this out. So we're going to introduce our guest. Pat, tell us a little bit about yourself, your full name, and a few, few words. Yeah, Pat McCauley, uh, born and raised in Boston. Um, have been an entrepreneur here in Boston since uh, I finished up school. And uh, yeah, Plant, Plant Pub is probably the first uh, venture that really is kind of aligned with my two passions, which, which are plant-based food and, and craft beer. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, let, let's just do a backstory on you because you're an interesting guy. Uh, first, in terms of beer, um, you, were, you were part of a brewery in Weymouth, Massachusetts. Tell us about that because brewers are cool and obviously you're bringing the sensibility of, of a brewery you know, it's kind of like open to all people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was fortunate enough to uh, team up with a guy who is very well known here in Boston for craft beer, a guy by the name of Russ Heisner. Um, I actually knew him my whole life. Um, and he was the first ever brewer for Harpoon in the 80s. So if you know beer here in Boston, Harpoon is uh, kind of the OG craft brewer here other than Sam Adams. Um, and uh, he had gone from brewing there. He was in craft beer for many years after that. Then he got into alternative fuels and was applying his fermentation knowledge to alternative fuels for BP. And when he was done with that, uh, he wanted to get back in the beer business. And I happened to just connect with him at the right time. And he kind of was looking for a young person that could do the media and the website and sort of the technical things that he wasn't uh, good at. Um, And yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to join that project and, uh, learned all about beer from a real master of the craft. So it was Barrel House Z. You got it, yeah. Barrel House Z in Weymouth. Uh, it's still open now uh, in its fifth fifth or sixth year now. And uh, yeah, they did. They just make great stuff. The uh, We started out doing barrel-aged beers primarily. Um, we found that was a little too niche, and we kind of opened things up, started doing IPAs, which we said would never do <laughs> when we started. But, I mean, that's what people want. And, uh, they're, yeah, they're making great beer down there. Well, this is pretty unusual. So I know this is a historic space, Beer Works in Boston, across from Fenway. I've never been here. I've only just started spending some time in Boston. Um, what does this place mean to you guys? So we'll talk more about the restaurant and the menu and all that. But just, just to locate it, I mean, we are across from Fenway Park, and you are serving beer. 
Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, it's a dream to have this space, you know, uh, definitely a lot of things had to come together for us to even be in the running for a space like this. It's, uh, yeah, one of maybe four locations that are literally at the entrance of Fenway Park here on this side of the park. Um, and yeah, th this had been Boston Beer Works for about 30 years. Um, a staple for anybody who's ever been to a Red Sox game, new Boston Beer Works. Um, yeah, in, in we're just super pumped to be kind of delivering what we feel to be a more modern pub experience. I love pubs. It's it's They didn't have lunch today. I know it's the all-star break, so there's not as much going on around Fenway, but there's staff coming in. It's getting set up. It's a big place, and there's a lot of energy here. So obviously you guys have a great operation. So, so back to you. So uh, food and beer. Um, most people don't know how to define, you know, not eating meat. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your journey because it is interesting. I mean, you've got a beer place, you're, you're across from a brewery and you're not serving any meat. So let's help us define what that is and tell us about your podcast too. I know you're, you're a real advocate for a, another form of diet, but I will say I'm looking at Pat, his eyes are clear, his skin's good. He looks in great shape. So maybe the answer for many of us, if we're, we're beer, beer drinkers is, is maybe to eat less meat. <laughs> <laughs> I would argue so. Yeah. I mean, this all started for me when I was at Barrel House Z. Um, you know, I, I come from a sports background. I played college football, um, and sort of, he looks like Julian Edelman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I was, I was like 25 years old and just felt like, uh, you know, I had always far, followed sort of the traditional athlete's diet of high protein and, you know, eggs for breakfast, chicken for lunch, steak for dinner sort of thing. Um, and that sort of worked for a period of time and worked through my athletic days. But then I just found it really hard to look and feel the way I wanted. And, you know, it's kind of the definition of insanity to always try the same way of eating and living and not get the results you want or not feel the way you think you can feel. Um, so I just remember finding this guy that I followed on social media. He was big into green smoothies and fruit and, you know, was, was vegetarian. And I thought that was absolutely crazy, but the guy was totally ripped and looked good in all this. And um, I just decided to try something new. And my sort of gateway drug, I always say, was... Uh, switching out my eggs in the morning for a big green smoothie with a bunch of fruits and vegetables in it. And, um, I had already eliminated, uh, cow's milk. I always, I had already switched to like almond milk at the time cause I felt like it was healthier. Um, and that, yeah, that was my gateway drug. I just felt so much better than the animal products in the morning. And then I just went on this experimental run of a few months, uh, where I really went whole food plant-based. Um, you know, I wasn't eating like impossible burgers and some of the things we serve here. I was truly eating, you know, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, that sort of stuff. And um, long story short, over a six month period, um, not only did I uh, kind of lose the extra football weight that I had on, uh, not only did I feel so much better energy wise, not only was I sleeping better, but all these health issues that I had had since a little kid started going away. You know, I was a kid that used to bring my inhaler to football practice. I, you know, would carry an EpiPen around for allergies. Um, you know, but I was never overweight. I was never, I was always a fit guy. So anytime I went to the doctors, it'd be like, you're doing great. Keep doing your thing. Um, and when I sort of, you know, overcame all those things with a, a simple change to what I was putting in my body, I was just like shocked that nobody had ever presented me with that information. It was always like, you go to the doctor, here's what's wrong. Here's the thing to manage what's wrong. But nobody ever said you can address what's causing it. Right. So when I stumbled into that, I just, it was kind of a profound thing for me. I kind of felt like I had been cheated or lied to by all the people I trusted in my life. You know, doctors, nutritionists that I had access to playing college sports and trainers and everybody. I was around people that knew or at least thought they knew health. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I started doing my research and I found out all the things I know now uh, about the nutrition science we have. Um, and I very much believe it points to the power of, you know, 90, 90% 90 of your diet being plant-based and you can really, um, eliminate and even reverse many of the lifestyle diseases that we all face. And we're going to drink beer too. Uh, g going way back in the nineties, I, I had a restaurant in East village, Manhattan, and, um, it, it wasn't necessarily by choice, but it didn't have meat. So it was fish, 
pastas, vegetables. And we got listed as a vegetarian restaurant in some cases. But at the time, I think that people assumed there was an ethos to it of like organic vegetarian and also like maybe not drinking. So f for you, how has it, how has it evolved? Because I, I see a lot of plant-based. Um, I know in New York and East Village, I saw some of the Matthew Kenny restaurants come through and it's come a long way. And the, and the, the term plant-based food I get it because I mostly eat plant-based. I eat whole grains. I eat, I eat vegetables and, you know, I have some meat or fish every day. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, I mean, it's a totally different ball game, uh, pun intended here next to Fenway Park, uh, than it was just 10 years ago. I mean, I started doing this personally about seven years ago. And, um, even just over that period, like all these new, plant-based products have come out, you know, there's a plant-based replacement for everything you can possibly think of now, whether it's a hot dog or a burger or chicken or chicken nuggets or literally anything. Um, and it's become obviously popular and a buzzword and, um, but nobody's really, in my opinion, applied it in a way that is mainstream and approachable to the average, everyday man, if you will. Um, especially here in Boston, you know, you have like the the health food concepts um, that, you know, if you're the average dude, like if you're the dude I was 10 years ago, like I'm not walking in there, like, or I'm not walking into a place with like a bunch of colors on the wall or Buddhas on the wall or anything like that wasn't approachable plant-based food to me. Um, so, you know, I think what we're doing here is, is welcoming people into plant-based food and beer is a big part of that, you know, and coming from beer, I know that tap rooms and breweries are places that just about everybody feels comfortable walking into. Whether you're a 60-year-old guy after your construction shift or the 21-year-old looking to try the newest, hottest IPA, like it just has this way of bringing people together in a very approachable manner. And I think if you can do that in a way, uh, the same way that brewers and tap rooms do, but just serve all plant-based pub food that you can really shift people's perspective on what plant-based food is and maybe open their eyes up to, wow, like, you know, I can do this once a week or I can do this a couple meals a week or whatever. And, you know, not only will it probably benefit my health, but it'll benefit, you know, the environment and the planet and all that good stuff too. So let's go back to you getting plant pubs started. I mean, you got some partners, just, just take us down that road. Um, it's interesting, you know, you, you're enthusiasts, you, you got into plant-based food, worked at a brewery, and now you, you've got this new project. Yeah. Um, well, step one was I just, when I left Barrel House, I committed to trying to make this come to life because that's what I wanted to do. And um, uh, we did a little pop-up concept. That's how we started uh, down south of Boston in Quincy. It was under a different brand name um, and with a different group of people. But to me, we did. We were there for about three months, uh, a pop-up concept, and to me, that proved. And it was in, in even more a, more of a blue-collar city than Boston. Um, and to me, that proved that, you know, it would work, um, and the demand was there, and I wasn't crazy. Um, and then from there, it took me a good year to find who my initial partner was, um, a guy named Sebastiano. Uh, Cosia Castiglione, and he's one of the biggest plant-based investors in the world. I won't ask you to say that again. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I won't ask you to say his name again. <laughs> but he, you know, that's that's what he specializes in. He, um, you know, he, he started with a uh, vegan winery um, in Tuscany. It's a famous Tuscan winery that he turned all vegan and organic and all that. Um, and now he's one of the most well-known investors in plant-based food. He's behind uh, Beyond Meat and a bunch of the big uh brands that are kind of household names now and uh yeah once i kind of had him and he believed in the concept and he has hospitality background and loves doing hospitality projects and we just hit it off and saw the same vision and uh from there we were able to get you know somebody of, of chef mary's talent level because we had that team and we had the backing and we had the support um, and then, you know, people took me seriously once I had him, right? Before that, it was just an idea. Um, so when that came together, we, we, we could bring in the best of the best. And, um, yeah, I, I met uh, Mary through a LinkedIn message and we met for a coffee. And um, I never thought in a million years she'd want to join a plant-based concept. But, uh, yeah, but, he, but here we are. 
Well, let's talk through those those early meetings w with the menus and some yeah. some of the foods that you develop because sometimes when you think about it, you're talking about you know mass produced meats is is a mass produced you know plant based product. Is it any different or any worse? Yeah. Um, I'm definitely interested in trying your Fenway Franks because especially when you talk about hot dogs, people always think there's mystery meat or something. Mm -hmm. um, so just talk to those those early meetings and how you guys evolve the menu. To, you know, it, this isn't just, like you said, nuts and, and raw vegetables. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's plenty of, when people hear plant-based, right, they, they assume, like, it's health food, right? Most people that don't know anything about it. And, you know, there's plenty of juice bars and there's plenty of smoothie bars in Boston, right? Um, and I highly suggest if you're seeking health that that's, that's what you should be eating most of the time. But, um, you know, we really want to do appeal to people that, you know, don't know anything about health food and aren't health conscious at all, but they want to make maybe a, be a better decision. We call it better. We're not saying we're health food by any means, but really what we wanted to do with the menu was, um, you know, make better versions for you of, of typical pub food. You know, when you go out to a pub, you're generally having burgers and pizzas and fries and that sort of thing. You know, it's not health food. Our version we think is better for you. Um, and really like everything on the menu, like we call chicken, chicken. We don't even do apostrophe N, right? We call cheese, cheese. We call burgers, burgers. And really we just want people to recognize what's on the menu, right? And from there, we're confident we can deliver a burger that will satisfy what you expect from a burger. Um, so it, it's not, you know, we intentionally don't use anything people have never heard of. We don't use quinoa or we don't use like things that your average person won't understand and be turned off by. Um, so it's meant to be just totally understandable. It's supposed to be pub food. Like just like you'd walk in anywhere and you'd order a pepperoni pizza, you order a pepperoni pizza here. It just happens to be made all from plants. So that was really the idea f behind the menu. It's just totally approachable, recognizable. Um, and then from there, if they have questions, we explain how we do things. So you're really smart. You don't have to put up signs and notes on the menu, say these items are vegan. If everything's vegan, then you don't have to explain it, right? Yeah, totally. And, and we don't even, the term you're using there, vegan, right? Like, we don't even use that. You, you won't see that anywhere. Um, I personally am, am vegan, obviously. But um, again, there's all kinds of stereotypes and stigmas that come with that. And would rather use the term plant-based, again, from an approachability standpoint. And it just is more welcoming, in my opinion, than, you know, putting vegan everywhere. Oh, that's great, man. This is a special place. Um, let's talk about the beer program and the, and the drinks program, too, because uh, you brought me out. You asked me if I wanted a drink, and I said vitamin C. Yeah. Have you, been, have you had vitamin C before? I've had it a couple of times in the Boston area. I, other than that, I, I don't know about it. Yeah. Yeah. So vitamin C opened up actually right next door to Barrel House Z. It's down in Weymouth, uh, literally the next door neighbor. They opened like two years um, after us in the same industrial park. And uh, they had started, um, you know, brewing in a basement in Hull, Massachusetts, like on the water, this little, uh, you know, seaside town uh, south of here and uh, just slowly developed this crazy following for their New England IPAs. And they were just giving them out free to people um, and then slowly worked up to open in a brewery. But um, in terms of beer, like those are the people we try to support here, you know? Um, the vitamin C's of the world, the barrel house C's, um, you know, the small craft brewers that are, you know, around Boston. And then the ones we also love that are, you know, up in Maine or Vermont or, you know, New England, I think has the best craft breweries in, in the country. Um, and we just try to honor those and, and we pick our favorite ones and the ones that uh, started like us with a pop-up or started small and, um, are people that really love the craft of it and, and love what they're doing. And um, over the years, I've gotten, like, I've developed a lot of great, great relationships in beer, like with vitamin C and, and those guys. And um, yeah, those are people we want to carry and celebrate because they're making the best beer around and they're local. And that's really the ethos of the entire beverage program, whether it's spirits or, or wine or anything. Well, I'm really happy I came here. It's it's you're very authentic, and and the, it feels like a great pub. Um, you know, the last few years we've heard the demise of the pub, the demise of the beer bar, because everyone's going to if they want to in beer, they're going to breweries. And and uh, why did you feel like you could open a 
decent sized pub um, as opposed to opening a brewery with it? Um, you know, I think beer here in Boston is, I think it's at the point now where there's so many good breweries. It's just, it's saturated and I'd rather carry the best of the best than like try to, you know, create another brand that people have to become aware of and follow. Like I'd rather almost leverage all the amazing brewers around here than to try and do it on our own. And then, yeah, so I just think there's a lot of good beer. I don't think like what we do requires us to brew beer. You know, people mostly come here, yes, for the beer, but uh, because, you know, it's it's different food wise. Um, yeah, I just think there's a lot of good beer and we didn't have to go that route. Well, that, that's encouraging and refreshing because I, I, I love a well-curated beer list and, and a restaurant, you know. So let's, let's talk through your menu because it's, it's really interesting. Um, right away, I, I saw a chicken fried sandwich and I said, that looks pretty good. And Fenway Frank, um, what, what's the secret? Let's just go through the menu because I, I don't think we have to describe them. They're, they're pretty cool. Yeah. So you got the Fenway Frank, mm-hmm. easy sell, chicken fried sandwich. What what are a few of the other menu items? Uh, so we have uh, a fried cauliflower. We call them fried cauliflower wings. Those are one of the most popular menu items. We do them buffalo style with a ranch dressing. We do a Korean barbecue with a uh, aioli dressing. Uh, both unbelievable, unbelievably popular. Our Cambridge location, those, that's the top seller, along with the chicken sandwich. Um, yeah, then we have burgers that you can do uh, a few different ways. We have just a classic burger that kind of tastes like, you know, a classic all-American cheeseburger. Uh, then we have a barbecue guac burger that we do like our version of a barbecue pulled pork on um, and, and some guacamole on it. That's also very popular. Uh, then we do a kimchi burger. It's like a, a, a burger with a little bit of a uh, Asian flair to it. We have like a, a kimchi slaw on it. Uh, that's really nice. And you can choose two different ways. So. We carry Impossible, Impossible Burger, uh, which we think is kind of the best burger replacement. Uh, but then we also have, if you're looking to be a little more healthy, uh, we make our own in-house uh, burger as well from, you know, black beans and rice and mushrooms, and that's more health forward. Um, then we have uh, a number of pizzas, pepperoni, buffalo chicken, barbecue chicken. We use a brand for our cheese out of Brooklyn uh, called Numu. Um, and they make cheese from, it's a, a soy and sweet potato base. Um, of all the cheeses I've tried uh, in the plant-based world, that melts the best, tastes the best. Uh, it looks like, to me, a, a real traditional pizza. Um, so that's what we use in the cheese front. Um, we got a couple other things like a chicken quesadilla. Um, on the dessert side, we have fraps. In Boston, we call them fraps, not milkshakes. Uh, I don't know why that is. I think it's because there was a chain of Brigham's. If you remember Brigham's ice cream, uh, that's a Boston thing. Uh, but they call them fraps. Uh, so we call we call them fraps. It's a Boston thing. Uh, you know, vanilla, chocolate, black and white frap. Uh, then we have soft serve, which is also one of our top sellers at our Kendall Cambridge location. Um, we do vanilla chocolate. We do a swirl. So you can get like that traditional... Dairy Queen looking swirl ice cream in a cone. Um, and that's made out of oats. Um, so we use an Oatly product, uh, if you're familiar with the Oatly brand. And then um, we have a strawberry shortcake uh, that we make in house um, biscuits here, um, you know, dairy, dairy free biscuits that are amazing. And then uh, we get a Sunday here as well, a s'more Sunday. Um, yeah, I think that more or less covers, we have a bunch of other appetizers like fries. We have a meze platter uh, that we do like our, we, we make our, our own pita bread here uh, with like hummus and, and some other dips. So we, we don't really have to talk too much about the ingredients because it just sounds like really good food, really good menu. Um, and then when you, when you started with your chef, just tell me again the, the name of your chef and um, like how did you decide that this chicken was the chicken you're going to use yeah uh so just because that's the thing i'd probably get i'd be like chicken fried chicken that texture that that flavor I, i'd be happy to get it I, I don't often always care what it is yeah yeah totally uh yeah so our chef is chef mary dumont and she has been 
in restaurants her entire life, you know, 30 years. Um, she's done just about everything. Iron Chef, Top Chef, Today Show. She was the first New Hampshire chef ever to be uh, Food and Wine Best Chef. Um, she's just done everything in her career. Um, so she's super talented, number one, and that's where it starts. The reason I can say, sit here and say our food is kick ass is because of her and her ridiculous talent. Um, but the, on the chicken front, um, that we actually make ourselves. So we don't use a, a chicken product or like a Beyond or Impossible or anything like that. She actually takes tofu, believe it or not, and she does this, I don't know if it's overnight or how long she marinates it in a specific thing to get more of a chicken flavor to it. And then it's double battered um, with like uh, oats and cornmeal and, and a certain flour. Um, it's fried and it's just, again, it's our one of our most popular things on the menu. And then there's a slaw with it, like a, um, a ranch slaw on it and pickles. And uh, it's just this big, hunky, meaty looking chicken sandwich and people absolutely love it. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, restaurants and bars in Boston. Uh, it's kind of neat here. I mean, there, there's bigger places. This is a 250 seat place. I, I feel like with my experience in New York City, especially in like the East Village, everything's small, 30 seats, 40 seats. Um, how, how do you run a place like this? Like what's your structure? I mean, right now, I don't know how many people are here working, but there's this energy to it. And, and uh, it, it's a great place. Well, oh, thank you, man. Yeah, we. I mean, first and foremost, like we try to, you know, hospitality traditionally can be stressful. Uh, it can be unhealthy. Um, and, you know, from the second people walk in the door, we try to like promote a culture of like, we're about making food that's better for you and better for the world, right? Like that's our, that's our mission. And we try to like carry that through to everybody that works here. Like, you know, health is first. And if you're struggling or um you know having a hard time or stressed out like what can we do to all as a team like help that person out and um you know and i think that like carries on to when somebody walks in the door you know they're greeted by somebody that feels like they're a part of something um you know that's good for them and they enjoy showing up and and all that good stuff um but i am not the expert <laughs> whatsoever on running a big uh, restaurant operation like this. We have are fortunate to have an incredible general manager, actually, who hails from uh, Brooklyn, um, who recently moved to Boston within the past few years. And um, she's just fantastic. Again, like, like Chef Mary has been in restaurants for many, many years um, and just knows how to run operations like this. I, I have no clue. So it's just fully a shout out to kind of the team and just the culture we try to you know, make happen here. No, it's a great operation. Hey, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. I'm Chava Perivan, co-host of Agave Road Trip on HRN, here to talk about 818 Tequila. 818 creates their tequila using traditional methods that a family owned and operate distillery in Jalisco, Mexico. From the blue agave they grow to their recycled glass bottle, 818 emphasizes the Earth's importance in all they do. Their distillery runs on biomass and solar power, which means they don't rely as much on fossil fuels and are able to reduce their carbon footprint. Their labels, corks, and boxes are all certified by the Forest Stewardship Council as coming from sustainability managed forests. 818 is a proud member of 1% for the Planet, through which they support HRN as well as Sacred, my organization in Jalisco, where together we transform agave byproducts and water waste into adobe bricks that are donated to local infrastructure projects, like a local library in Zapotitlan de Vadillo. Visit drink818.com to learn more about their sustainability efforts and find 818 near you. 818 has been part of so many magical nights for me, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. Hi, I'm Harry Rosenblum from the Time for Lunch podcast. And one way that Heritage Radio Network has impacted me is it has given me the opportunity to sit down and talk with hundreds of people from all over the world and different cultures. And it is always eye-opening, the things that I learn and get to share on Heritage Radio Network. HRN is home to transformative exchanges about food. 
We hope our diverse lineup of shows opens your eyes, educates, and empowers. Join us during our summer membership drive by donating and becoming a member. Members play an essential role in keeping nonprofit food radio on the air. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate to become a member today. Thank you for your support. Hey, hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Hey, support us and become a member at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. You might get one of these really cool hats. HRN is pretty stylish and some other, some other swag. HeritageRadioNetwork.org slash donate. So I, I took a trip to Boston. I'm, I'm uh, across from Fenway Park. Yes, I do like baseball, and it's all-star break. So I got, I got a chance to catch uh, Pat McCauley at Plant Pub, uh, it, and it's kind of a quiet week here because the Red Sox aren't playing. So we got a chance to catch up. So, Pat, we're talking about a lot of things. But, Pat, you have a podcast, which is kind of neat, too. So podcast to podcast. T- tell us about that and – part of your journey you know, an athlete he looks like a julian edelman if you guys know the new england patriots um and he, he switched over to a plant-based diet and and the thing is we did talk about this earlier that his his, his journey was not about like becoming a buddhist or, or something it, it's kind of this new contemporary plant-based food which to me sounds totally normal and they they're they're doing that so let's talk about the podcast and i'm sure part of your journey was doing this podcast and just tell me, like, one really great person you talked to on your show. Yeah, sure, yeah. So the, the podcast started really because, again, I was, like, shocked by my experience and what I was learning about nutrition science and why nobody, nobody – I had never heard before that I could address what was causing my health issues, you know? Um, so I started the podcast just to interview people that had had sim- similar experiences to me with food, you know, healing themselves with food or changing – uh, their their life and how they felt with food. Um, and yeah, I was just fascinated by it. I wanted to hear other stories and I wanted to talk to experts that um, I had become aware of that have been, you know, studying nutrition and food's impact on disease and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And um, I always say my first ever episode was with my mom. So I interviewed my mom after she agreed to go six weeks plant-based with me, whole food plant-based. Uh, so we did six weeks. We walked together every day. It was, I I think back, it was like a, a really fun time that we both had, you know, together. I'm one of eight kids. So like I spending that amount of time alone with my mom was like a very rare thing. I I never got that growing up. So, um, that was a fun thing in itself, but I interviewed her after and, you know, sure enough, like she had a medication or two she was on that she no longer needed literally within six weeks. Um, and just, you know, lost 15 pounds, was feeling better, which is changing her diet and a couple mile walk every day. It's not like we're doing CrossFit or anything, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, that, that's how the podcast started. And then from there, I just started, it started with her cause I had I didn't know anybody that had, that eat, ate plant-based or that had had an experience with it. So I was like, all right, Ma, you're doing this. <laughs> she was nice enough to do it. So you had that long time with your mom, one of eight yeah. kids. So did you ever ask her who her favorite child was? <laughs> I know better than that, uh, not to ask that question. Uh, no, I mean, she would, she would not answer that question, I'm sure. But, um, you know, everybody, I mean, my, I don't know how my parents did it. Everybody has turned out uh, A-OK and are, are great, great human beings. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm no, you, you're awesome, man. So, like, just going back to this plant-based diet, it, it, there's those books about the places in the world, like ones in – Italy and ones in Japan, ones where people live to be a hundred, but this, it's always the same story. It's like they live in the country, they work at least tending gardens or, or, or plants. They're also usually walking up hillsides mm-hmm. <laughs> and that also means they're eating like fresh picked vegetables. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. So you're referring to blue zones, which is uh, Dan Buettner's work on the, on the pockets of the world where people live the longest. Um, and yeah, one is Sardinia, One's uh, Loma Linda, California. There's one in South America, uh, Okinawa, Japan. Oh, we got a burger coming here. Oh, let's talk about. Hey, just tell us what you brought us, brother. Uh, so right here we have our classic burger with an impossible patty and a side of fries, and for dipping sauce we have our spicy aioli. Also a New Yorker here. Let's go, Mets. Mets fan. We got a Mets All right, fan. brother. Yeah, right <laughs> from Fenway here. Take it easy, everybody. <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, we gave it, that's that's just a, a classic burger and fries. Um, they must not have been ready on the on the hot dogs just yet today. Um, but yeah, that's just classic burger. It, you know, it's right down the middle. It, it's what you'd expect from a burger and fries. Um, yeah, but uh, back to back to uh, blue zones that you asked me about. Um, yeah, there, there are five pockets of the world. They have the most centenarians uh, of all places in the world, and. Yeah, one of the one of the common threads is they eat 90 to 95 percent plant based, uh, but the other threads are also important, right? That they have really strong sense of community. They walk everywhere. Um, you know, if you don't show up for Sunday church or the local farmers market, you know, come, if somebody comes knocking on your door. There's just a really strong like sense of belonging, um, and that's that I believe is also a big piece of it. But um, yeah, one of the common things they all eat is uh, legumes, beans, some form of beans. Um, but, you know, meat is treated as a delicacy. Uh, you know, they have it once a week or, you know, for special occasions type thing, as opposed to like here in, in the U.S. in most places, it's the center of the plate. So um, in those places, it's mostly plant-based and they eat small amounts of meat. Um, but uh, yeah. The other a big part of that also it seemed like in every place where people live to be a hundred they also walk hills all the time. Definitely, yeah, I know a lot of a lot of the places are hilly, and they, yeah, that's the other piece. They most uh, places they don't drive; they walk everywhere. So they're small communities where you walk to the grocery store or the farmers market, or you walk to your friend's house. You know, they're they're a lot of them like there's very little cars. Um, so they're always moving throughout the day. Again, they don't do CrossFit or like go to a spin class. It's just they are gardening, as you mentioned, or they're moving throughout the day. Um, it's low impact, uh, but they're getting their exercise. So it's kind of like, I think probably the sweet spot if like you want to live long. For sure. well, I love that you, you love craft beer because uh, I feel like all these foods fit right in. I mean, honestly, a lot of times when I go to a pub, if I had French fries like this, it's almost all I want. I might have fries covered with, do you have a, uh, like you have loaded nachos. Do you have loaded fries? We do. Yeah. So we do the fries a few different ways. So if you see that aioli that came with them. So depending on like when you order it to go, we drizzle the aioli on it, but you can also do uh, a queso fry. We make like a cashew queso uh, that we drizzle over the fries. And then we do a uh, chili queso fries as well. And we make like a impossible meat, bean, chili. That's awesome. And we dump that on the fries and uh, it's, it's delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I know you can do a lot with beans. A friend of mine is a Filipino chef in New York, King Fajanagong. And um, he's got, he calls it like a, it's a black bean ragu where it's, there's meat in it as well, but it's mostly the black beans and the way they're cooked, they come out like little small pieces and they, and it does taste like a meat ragu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's you, you wouldn't believe the amount of things you can do with with beans or like, I mean, even like we use uh, things like uh, aquafaba, which is like the um, kind of juice from like a can of chickpeas. Like the it creates like a, almost like an egg white type thing that we'll use in like um, cocktails or we'll even use it in baking. So there's all kinds of like these these plant foods that can very much replicate like what you what you want to experience when you have, you know, a meat-like product. You know, I have a friend, a musician, who maybe 10 years ago went, went plant-based, based on his doctor's recommendation, but he embraced it and basically went, you know, found every cuisine from every culture that didn't have meat in it. And um, I was with a friend yesterday for, who just spent two years in Japan, and he was talking about some of the foods they have there, and he also doesn't eat meat. So he was talking about getting a, a, a corn co on the cob, and you slice it so that that, corn comes off like a rib where it's you know what that is and then it's like fried in the tempura uh, it, tell me some experiences like that that you've had in other places because when i when i thought thinking about japanese food tempura vegetables you know I, i'm not missing meat in in those those cuisines yeah i i would i i either go to like when i'm traveling or i'm looking for a place to eat i definitely like go towards mexican or asian you know, and yeah, like a uh, like a ramen or like any sort of like Asian noodle dish, like most of those you can, you know, if you ask for it without egg, you get all the same exact flavors and 
uh, you know, uh, like especially Asian, they like they use tofu to begin with. And most Asian places have a tofu version of fried rice or whatever you're you're looking for. Um, and then, yeah, Mexican is another one. You can always get a tacos, you know, with black beans instead of you know chicken or whatever. You can always get a burrito and ask for it, uh, you know, with tofu or whatever. I mean, you can even go to Chipotle and they got the sofritas, which is you know tofu that they marinate and everything and you can get a huge burrito and um you know so it's it's a lot easier than people think i i tend to go mexican or asian cuisine when i'm traveling and i i don't really have anything i'm familiar with around are, are you familiar with um vegan barbecue i uh, i actually do some barbecue events in new york and i just met a woman chef Kerry from pure grit barbecue which is all vegan in new york city um she told me about her, her pulled pork. Do you know how to make a vegan pulled pork? We make a, a vegan pulled pork here um, that we put on the barbecue guac burger. That's like our version of pulled pork. Um, but also we have carried intermittently uh, when we can get it. Uh, there's a company out of the Carolinas called Barbecue um, that's similar to your friend there makes all vegan barbecue. And they're actually like a couple of guys that were big, like big into smoking meat. Um, and then they, they change their diet, I, I believe for health reasons and are now big into plant-based food, but they miss their barbecue. So again, they're taking like sweet potato and soy and all these different plants. And they're like, they have, a, they literally have a smokehouse facility and they, they take all those products and they smoke it and they get all those same flavors that we love from a roast pig or whatever. Um, and they're making it plant-based. So, uh, We've used some of their products over, over the, the past year um, in Cambridge and here. Uh, but we also make uh, one ourselves that Chef Mary makes um, just from like a soy base that is kind of like thinly sliced. And then, I mean, most of the stuff, it comes down to like the marinade and how you cook it and, and all that. You yeah, know, I've had things slow, slow smoked where, you know, you, you let it go really slow. And even in the embers, whether it's onions, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beets. Beets, beets, and, and I want to bring this to ingredients now. Um, for me, I, I, I guess I'm coming around to the idea that there are a lot of products that are, can be vegan or meat that are produced in, in larger quantities. But I'm at heart like a, a Farm to Chef fan just from my own personal mm -hmm. home. I find a farm network and I buy from farms. And there's nothing like the taste of a fresh onion, mm -hmm. a fresh egg. It's an egg. I said egg and and beets or something else, and you and you grow to love them. Like I, last winter, I was just getting beets from a farmer, and I never ate beets before regularly, and and I got to have this whole winter of beets. Um, I know it's different in a restaurant because you, you're dealing with larger quantities, but in your own personal life and on your podcast, how, do, do you have connections with certain farmers? Or is that a part of the experience that, that you're that you're doing as well? Yeah, I mean, here we definitely try to use as many local farmers as we can use for, you know, whether it's just the lettuce on the burger or the tomato or, you know, things that go in the salad or, or whatever. Like we, we definitely try to do that. It is challenging, as you said, when you're doing large quantities, especially like here, you know, we haven't even faced our first Red Sox game here yet. Uh, we will on Friday night and it's a 10 day homestand. And so the night we opened, Zach Brown was playing at Fenway Park, and we got. You know, Wait, you you just opened the other day. We just opened on uh, this past Friday. Yeah, yeah. This location, this location. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so our opening night, Zach Brown was playing. So we had. Yeah. So when I walked in, people were saying they looked at me like, "Did I work here?" Yeah. People were coming in saying, introducing themselves to each other. So this was really like a whole new crew. A whole new crew, yeah. Uh, we had we had done some training, like probably, you know, three four days last week leading up to that Friday. But this is a whole new crew, yeah. That, uh, yeah, they're just a bunch of good people. You know what I mean? Um, again, super fortunate for that. But we got a taste on Friday, like what the crowds that Fenway Park brings, and it was just insanity in here. Um, and you know, we had people that. We're coming because it was an open, you know, these garage doors open in the front and you have thousands of people on the sidewalk and it's just kind of, they see the taps and you can like, you know, it's an open bar. Like people are flooding in because we're one of four restaurants around Fenway Park that is right next to it. And, uh, you know, I had a guy, you know, there are hundreds of people in here, but I had a guy leaving 
uh, that had had a pepperoni pizza and like a few beers with his buddies. And I was like, thanks for coming. Like, you know, do you normally eat plant-based food? Like I was trying to get some, some feedback from people. And this guy was from like New Hampshire, you know, kind of rural area. He was here to see some country music. And he was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, you know, like the pepperoni, like we're fully plant-based. And he was like, like he didn't understand what I was saying. He thought he just had a pepperoni pizza and a few IPAs, you know? Um, so that's like really cool. Like in to answer one of like your original questions back when, like how excited I am about this, like because of the proximity to Fenway Park, like so many people that are walking in here have one, never heard of plant-based food and two have never tried it. So like the opportunity to kind of like show people how good it can be, um, is like, I think really, really cool. Wow. I mean, you're definitely like defining this in a, in a different way that I, that I haven't seen. You're right. Other than at like s some local small restaurant where they're making traditional cuisines. Um, this guy, Matthew Kenny, I, I, I know of him from New York City. Um, he was a well-known chef and then he, be he became a vegan and had plant-based restaurants. And actually where he had a few was where I lived for a long time in the East Village. Um, how did you guys connect with him? Because, again, th there's something bigger going on here. This isn't just a little little shop in Cambridge anymore. Yeah. Yeah, no. So we were really fortunate when we were – he was looking at this space. Him and his company were looking at this space for a plant-based concept, obviously, because that's what he does. Um, and the landlord here is the same landlord as their uh, Boston location of Double Zero, which is a plant-based pizza concept uh, that's on Newberry Street. Uh, so he already kind of had an in with the landlord and had a relationship. Um, and we were also looking at the space and we were, you know, getting a tour and they were getting a tour and we realized we were both looking at it. We're the only, you know, plant-based concepts in town. And uh, we also share uh, Sebastiano is their primary investor. He's also ours. So we had a mutual connection. Um, I had also had Matthew on my podcast, um, you know, a few months prior to us figuring this out. So we all kind of knew each other to begin with. And it's a small world in the plant-based food space. Um, and, you know, I didn't want Matthew Kenny to do a, you know, plant-based beer concept next to Fenway Park because, like, we're a plant pub. Like, we're the plant-based Boston concept. So that wouldn't have been good for us. Um, at the same time, you know, they have 50-some-odd restaurants around the world and do so many different things. And they're like, oh, there's already this team here that's super passionate about what they do like and it just made sense to get together and and do it together and um you know like something of this scale coming from like our small uh Cambridge location like would not have been possible without you know bringing on Matthew and, and his team and um yeah so it's kind of like elevated us really really quickly to be able to do something of this size and, and something this impactful so uh, and then they're, you know, they're the leading plant-based restaurant group in the world, uh, for a reason. He's been doing it for 20 years now and, um, it's just so committed and aligned with our mission and our goals. And, uh, it was just, yeah, awesome to have them like want to back us to begin with. No, th this is a great place. It's very welcoming. And, uh, like I said, I'm eyeing this, uh, this burger right now. We're not, we're, yeah, <laughs> we're going to eat it. But, um, I want to go back to like this other thing about like foods. Like when I love food, as you guys know, I love beer. I love food. When I think about different, like if you grew up Catholic, you probably had fish on Fridays. I heard the story of McDonald's. The reason they have the, the fish fillets, cause in Cincinnati, there are a lot of Catholics, right? And they, they had to have fish. The franchises were dying on Fridays. And so I understand the impact of religion and culture on, on diet. My grandfather grew up in a small farm in the south of Italy. Uh, he was born in 1905. He always told the story of beans. When he came to America, he never wanted to eat a bean again because when he was a kid, there were times and seasons when they only had dried beans. And if he, if he was a little kid, says, I don't want any more beans, his father would say, go to bed until you want to eat your beans. So I'm sure I know when people came to America and there was a lot of meat, it did change their 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 diets. I have a friend, Louisa Shufia, who's, uh, her family was from Persia, and she really documented this in some of her books. Louisa Shafia is great. Um, she talked about her father coming from Persia. Again, the same thing from traditional diets, traditional foods, coming to America where, you know, there's steak in, a, in every supermarket. And of course, he put on weight, had diabetes. And it was through her going back and learning traditional cooking 
that she helped heal him. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I understand it's like this a dichotomy. You know, in America, we have access to things that no one in the world ever had, and traditionally. So we're trying to find a balance. Mm-hmm. In our lives, but like one thing I know, like like kosher in New York, especially the kosher food, there's certain rules, and um, I don't know if you had to do this when you retrofitted. So, like I know people that run like a kosher vegetarian d- d- diner. It's called B and H East Village. Been there forever. It's actually owned now by Egyptian Muslims, and his wife is a Polish Catholic. But it's still the rabbi comes in and certified. So when they had to renovate, they had to buy all new equipment. Because it's like trafe. It's it's right. it's it's spoiled if it ever had touched anything else. Mm-hmm. Now, do you have, did you go through that when you took over this this space? Did you have to? Can you use previous stoves and, and ovens, or did you have to start from scratch uh, to to kind of satisfy your your ideals? Yeah, I mean, we we replaced all the kitchen equipment to answer your question, um, and we are in the process of actually getting kosher certified. Uh, because most plant-based restaurants can very easily with some very small tweaks. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, you know, this, this restaurant, although there were some, some equipment that was probably salvageable, it wasn't great, but we, we could have salvaged it. But I mean, it's been frying chicken, you know, for 30 years and, and cooking, you know, animal products for 30 years. And again, yeah, for, for like what we're trying to do and, uh, to be true to what we do, we felt it was right to get all new equipment and, and make sure that, you know, there wasn't that sort of stuff, uh, you know, on the equipment from years and years of, of cooking animals. It's like my wife, she's a tea drinker, doesn't drink coffee. If I put any coffee in one of her teacups, she'll know forever <laughs> yeah. that it tastes like coffee, right? Yeah, yeah there's, there's a... You know, with coffee, sure, and then like, yeah, with like animal products too. It's like there's a there's a fattiness, you know, like, you know, when you get the uh, scrambled eggs from the local diner, you know, that just for some reason tastes a little bit better. It's that the years of grease and fat on the on the flat top, you know. Uh, so yeah, we we definitely that was important to us to switch everything out. So kids, I can't sneak bacon into my asparagus skillet anymore <laughs> there you go i'll make a confession I, I i my first restaurant in the east village in new york in the 90s i i had like i lived in san francisco when i was young and it was my first exposure to, to vegetarian food and i lived in the mission of san francisco in the 90s before it was expensive but that was the first time i kind of lived mostly vegetarian and my first restaurant actually mugs Cha Cha in the east village i ended up choosing to not have any meat for practical reasons that I had this very small restaurant getting in a box of 40 pounds. And honestly, handling meat can be, can be challenging if you're not doing a lot of volume and getting the 40 pound case of chicken breast or something in a couple of days, that stuff turns. Mm-hmm. So I kind of made the choice to not, not try to do everything. And I focused on fish cause I had a fish monger nearby and salads and pasta. And that was my first restaurant. We did really well. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to, 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 to talk about this in a way that I'm, that I'm I guess I am enlightened. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, uh, I appreciate your approach, man, because um, I was a little put off when I first heard that, that, that plant pub, just like some of your, your uh, baseball fans walking in the door, did not expect this, but this seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. Like, in, in, again, to come back to, like, what we're doing, like, you know we want everything to be approachable to anybody. And I I think like with, with plant-based food, the, the man's man is, is who is turned off by it. You know, when you hear the term vegan or plant-based, right, the traditional kind of meat eater, like we don't have to convince your average female to come in and eat plant-based, you know, like, like we see it in Cambridge all the time. Like that's a, that's a shoe in, but um, you know, there's, there's no place that welcome, welcomes in the sports fan or the kind of man's man sort of person. Um, and then that's, that's really like what we're trying to do and just kind of to knock down the barrier and eliminate the stereotypes and just like, you know, wherever you stand on the spectrum of healthy, not healthy, you know, carnivore, vegan, like whatever it is, like you can come here and find something you enjoy. Uh, yes, it happens to be all plant-based, but, um, you know, we're not going to, you know, yell at you or 
you know, that you need to eat vegan or you need to go plant-based or whatever. It's just like, you know, this is what we do. It's a fun, exciting, friendly environment. Um, and your food, in my opinion, tastes better than any pub food you're going to get around here. Um, and it's a great experience. And the Red Sox game is on the TV. And it, it, it checks all the boxes of, of what you expect and what you love about pubs. It's just done in a more in a more what what we feel is a is a more conscious manner so i don't even have to go to the red sox game i could just come here oh i mean yeah i mean you know maybe catch an inning but you're not gonna <laughs> you know they're they're struggling this year anyway so it's been a great show recording live at plant pub across from fenway park in boston massachusetts big thanks to pat mccauley one of the co-founders at plant pub for joining me on heritage radio network i'm jimmy carboni i'm the host Big thanks to our engineer, Armin Spengen, and producing intern, Alex Tran. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.